Chapter Thirteen of *The Hour of the Dragon* by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen: A Ghost Out of the Past. Soon after sunrise, Conan crossed the Argosian border. Of Beloso, he had seen no trace. Either the captain had made good his escape while the king lay senseless or had fallen prey to the grim man-eaters of the Zingara forest. But Conan had seen no signs to indicate the latter possibility. The fact that he had lain unmolested for so long seemed to indicate that the monsters had been engrossed in futile pursuit of the captain. And if the man lived, Conan felt certain that he was riding along the road somewhere ahead of him. Unless he had intended going into Argos, he would never have taken the eastern road in the first place. The helmeted guards at the frontier did not question the Cimmerian. A single wandering mercenary required no passport nor safe conduct, especially when his unadorned mail showed him to be in the service of no lord. Through the low grassy hills where streams murmured and oak groves dappled the sward with lights and shadows, he rode following the long road that rose and fell away ahead of him over dales and rises in the blue distance. It was an old, old road, this highway from Pointaine to the sea. Argos was at peace. Laden oxwains rumbled along the road, and men with bare, brown, brawny arms toiled in orchards and fields that smiled away under the branches of the roadside trees. Old men on settles before inns under spreading oak branches called greetings to the wayfarer. From the men that worked the fields, from the garrulous old men in the inns where he slaked his thirst with great leathern jacks of foaming ale, from the sharp-eyed silk-clad merchants he met upon the road, Conan sought for news of Belloso. Stories were conflicting, but this much Conan learned that a lean, wiry Zingaran with the dangerous black eyes and moustaches of the western folk was somewhere on the road ahead of him, and apparently making for Mesantia. It was a logical destination. All the seaports of Argos were cosmopolitan, in strong contrast with the inland provinces, and Mesantia was the most polyglot of all craft of all the maritime nations rode in its harbor and refugees and fugitives from many lands gathered there laws were lax for mesantia thrived on the trade of the sea and her citizens found it profitable to be somewhat blind on their dealings with seamen it was not only legitimate trade that flowed into mesantia smugglers and buccaneers played their part all this Conan knew well, for had he not, in the days of old, when he was a Barakan pirate, sailed by night into the harbor of Mesantia to discharge strange cargoes? Most of the pirates of the Barakan Isles, small islands off the southwestern coast of Zingara, were Argosian sailors, and as long as they confined their attentions to the shipping of other nations, the authorities of Argos were not too strict in their interpretation of sea laws. But Conan had not limited his activities to those of the Barakans. He had also sailed with the Zingaran buccaneers, and even with those wild black corsairs that swept up from the far south to harry the northern coasts, and this put him beyond the pale of any law. If he were recognized in any of the ports of Argos, it would cost him his head. But without hesitation he rode on to Mesantia. Halting day or night only to rest the stallion and to snatch a few winks of sleep for himself. He entered the city unquestioned, merging himself with the throngs that poured continually in and out of this great commercial center. No walls surrounded Mesantia. The sea and the ships of the sea guarded the great southern trading city. It was evening when Conan rode leisurely through the streets that marched down to the waterfront. At the ends of these streets he saw the wharves and the masts and sails of ships. He smelled salt water for the first time in years. 
heard the thrum of cordage and the creak of spars in the breeze that was kicking up white caps out beyond the headlands again the urge of far wandering tugged at his heart but he did not go to the wharves he reined aside and rode up a steep flight of wide worn stone steps to a broad street where ornate white mansions overlooked the waterfront and the harbor below here dwelt the men who had grown rich from the hard-won fat of the sea a few old sea captains who had found treasure afar many traders and merchants who never trod the naked decks nor knew the roar of tempest or sea fight conan turned in his horse at a certain gold-worked gate and rode into a court where a fountain tinkled and pigeons fluttered from marble coping to marble flagging a paid in jagged silken jumper jupon and hose came forward inquiringly the merchants of messantia dealt with many strange and rough characters but most of these smacked of the sea it was strange that a mercenary trooper should so freely ride into the court of a lord of commerce the merchant publio dwells here it was more statement than question and something in the timbre of the voice caused the page to doff his feather chaperone as he bowed and replied ay so he does my captain conan dismounted and the page called a servitor who came running to receive the stallion's rein your master is within conan drew off his gauntlets and slapped the dust of the road from cloak and mail ay my captain whom shall i announce i'll announce myself grunted conan i know the way well enough bide you here and obeying that peremptory command the page stood still staring after conan as the latter climbed a short flight of marble steps and wondering what connection his master might have with this giant fighting man who had the aspect of a northern barbarian menials at their tasks halted and gaped open-mouthed as conan crossed a wide cool balcony overlooking the court and entered a broad corridor through which the sea breeze swept halfway down this he heard a quill scratching and turned into a broad room whose many wide casements overlooked the harbor publio sat at a carved teakwood desk writing on rich parchment with a golden quill he was a short man with a massive head and quick dark eyes his blue robe was of the finest watered silk trimmed with cloth of gold and from his thick white throat hung a heavy gold chain as the cimmerian entered the merchant looked up with a gesture of annoyance he froze in the midst of his gesture his mouth opened he stared at a ghost out of the past unbelief and fear glimmered in his wide eyes well said conan have you no word of greeting publio publio moistened his lips honan he whispered incredulously mithra conan amra who else the cimmerian unclasped his cloak and threw it with his gauntlets down upon the desk how men he exclaimed irritably can't you at least offer me a beaker of wine my throat's caked with the dust of the highway ay wine echoed publio mechanically instinctively his hand reached for a gong then recoiled as from a hot coal and he shuddered while conan watched him with a flicker of grim amusement in his eyes the merchant rose and hurriedly shut the door first craning his neck up and down the corridor to be sure that no slave was loitering about then returning he took a gold vessel of wine from a nearby table and was about to fill a slender goblet when conan impatiently took the vessel from him and lifting it with both hands drank deep and with gusto ah it's conan right enough muttered publio man are you mad by chrome publio said conan lowering the vessel but retaining it in his hands you dwell in different quarters than of old it takes an argosian merchant to wring wealth out of a little waterfront shop that stank of rotten fish and cheap wine the old days are past muttered publio drawing his robe about him with a slight involuntary shudder 
I have put off the past like a worn-out cloak. Well, retorted Conan, you can't put me off like an old cloak. It isn't much I want of you, but that much I do want, and you can't refuse me. We had too many dealings in the old days. Am I such a fool that I'm not aware that this fine mansion was built on my sweat and blood? How many cargoes from my galleys passed through your shop? All merchants of Nisantia have dealt with the sea rovers at one time or another, mumbled Publio nervously. But not with the black corsairs, answered Conan grimly. For Mithra's sake be silent, ejaculated Publio, sweat starting out on his brow. His finger jerked at the gilt-worked edge of his robe. Well, I only wish to recall it to your mind, answered Conan. Don't be so fearful. You took plenty of risks in the past, when you were struggling for life and wealth in that lousy little shop down by the wharves, and were hand in glove with every buccaneer and smuggler and pirate from here to the Barakan Isles. Prosperity must have softened you. I am respectable, began Publio. <laughs> Meaning you're rich as hell, snorted Conan. Why? Why did you grow wealthy so much quicker than your competitors? Was it because you did a big business in ivory and ostrich feathers, copper and skins and pearls and hammered gold ornaments, and other things from the coast of Kush? And where did you get them so cheaply, while other merchants were paying their weight in silver to the Stygians for them? I'll tell you, in case you've forgotten. You bought them from me, at considerably less than their value, and I took them from the tribes of the Black Coast, and from the ships of the Stygians, I and the Black Corsairs. In Mithra's name cease, begged Publio. I have not forgotten. But what are you doing here? I am the only man in Argos who knew that the king of Aquilonia was once Conan the Buccaneer in the old days. But word has come southward of the overthrow of Aquilonia and the death of the king. My enemies have killed me a hundred times by rumors, grunted Conan. Yet here I sit and guzzle wine of Kairos, and he suited the action to the word. Lowering the vessel, which was now nearly empty, he said, It is but a small thing I ask of you, Publio. I know that you are aware of everything that goes on in Mesantia. I want to know if a Zingara named Beloso, or he might call himself anything, is in this city. He's tall and lean and dark like all his race, and it's likely he'll seek to sell a very rare jewel. Publio shook his head. I have not heard of such a man, but thousands come and go in Mesantia. If he is here, my agents will discover him. Good. Send them to look for him, and in the meantime have my horse cared for, and have food served me here in this room. Publio assented volubly, and Conan emptied the wine vessel, tossed it carelessly into a corner, and strode to a nearby casement, involuntarily expanding his chest as he breathed deep of the salt air. He was looking down upon the meandering waterfront streets. He swept the ships in the harbor with an appreciative glance, then lifted his head and stared beyond the bay far into the blue haze of the distance where sea met sky, and his memory sped beyond that horizon to the golden seas of the south under flaming suns, where laws were not and life ran hotly. Some vagrant scent of spice or palm woke clear-etched images of strange coasts where mangroves grew and drums thundered, of ships locked in battle and decks running blood, of smoke and flame and the crying of slaughter. Lost in his thoughts, he scarcely noticed when Publio stole from the chamber. Gathering up his robe, the merchant hurried along the corridors until he came to a certain chamber where a tall, gaunt man with a scar upon his temple wrote continually upon parchment. There was something about this man which made his clerkly occupation seem incongruous. To him, Publio spoke abruptly. Conan has returned. Conan? 
the gaunt man started up and the quill fell from his fingers the corsair i the gaunt man went livid is he mad if he is discovered here we are ruined they will hang a man whose shelters are trades with a corsair as quickly as they'll hang the corsair himself what if the governor should learn of our past connections with him he will not learn answered publio grimly send your men into the markets and wharfside dives and learn if one peloso a zingaran is in mesantia conan said he had a gem which he will probably seek to dispose of the jewel merchants should know of him if any do and here is another task for you pick up a dozen or so desperate villains who can be trusted to do away with a man and hold their tongues afterward you understand me i understand the other nodded slowly and somberly i have not stolen cheated lied and fought my way up from the gutter to be undone now by a ghost out of my past muttered pulio and the sinister darkness of his countenance at that moment would have surprised the wealthy nobles and ladies who bought their silks and pearls from his many stalls but when he returned to conan a short time later bearing in his own hands a platter of fruit and meats he presented a placid face to his unwelcome guest conan still stood at the casement staring down into the harbor at the purple and crimson and vermilion and scarlet sails of galleons and carracks and galleys and drummonds there's a stygian galley if i'm not blind he remarked pointing to a long low slim black ship lying apart from the others anchored off the low broad sandy beach that curved round to the distant headland is there peace then between stygia and argos the same sort that has existed before answered publio setting the platter on the table with a sigh of relief for it was heavily laden he knew his guest of old stygian ports are temporarily open to our ships as ours to theirs but may no craft of mine meet their cursed galleys out of sight of land that galley crept into the bay last night what its masters wish i do not know so far they have neither bought nor sold i distrust those dark-skinned devils treachery had its birth in that dusky land i'll make them howl said conan carelessly turning from the window in my galley manned by black corsairs i crept to the very bastions of the sea-washed castles of black-walled kehemi by night and burned the galleons anchored there and speaking of treachery mine host suppose you taste these viands and sip a bit of this wine just to show me that your heart is on the right side Publio complied so readily that Conan's suspicions were lulled, and without further hesitation he sat down and devoured enough for three men. And while he ate, men moved through the markets and along the waterfront, searching for a Zingaran who had a jewel to sell, or who sought for a ship to carry him to foreign ports. And a tall, gaunt man with a scar on his temple sat with his elbows on a wine-stained table in a squalid cellar with a brass lantern hanging from a smoke-blackened beam overhead and held converse with ten desperate rogues some pretender whom he will claim as king conan tarasus laughed but there was no conviction in his laughter he surreptitiously felt of a scar beneath his jupon and remembered ravens that cawed on the trail of a fugitive remember the body of his squire aridaeus brought back from the border mountains horribly mangled by a great gray wolf his terrified soldiers said but he also remembered a red jewel stolen from a golden chest while a wizard slept and he said nothing and valerius remembered a dying nobleman who gasped out a tale of fear and he remembered four kithens who disappeared into the mazes of the south and never returned but he held his tongue for hatred and suspicion of his allies ate at him like a worm 
and he desired nothing so much as to see both rebels and Nemedians go down locked in the death grip. But Amalric exclaimed, It is absurd to dream that Conan lives. For answer, Zaltotun cast a roll of parchment on the table. Amalric caught it up, glared at it. From his lips burst a furious, incoherent cry. He read, To Zaltotun, Grand Faker of Nemedia, Dog of Acheron, I am returning to my kingdom, and I mean to hang your hide on a bramble. Conan A forgery! exclaimed Amalric. Zaltotun shook his head. It is genuine. I have compared it with the signature on the royal documents on record in the libraries of the court. None could imitate that bold scrawl. Then, if Conan lives, muttered Amalric, this uprising will not be like the others, for he is the only man living who can unite the Aquilonians. But, he protested, this is not like Conan. Why should he put us on our guard with his boasting? One would think that he would strike without warning, after the fashion of the barbarians. We are already warned, pointed out Zaltotun. Our spies have told us of preparations for war in Poitain. He could not cross the mountains without our knowledge, so he sends his defiance in characteristic manner. Why to you? demanded Valerius. Why not to me or to Tarascus? Zaltotun turned his inscrutable gaze upon the king. Conan is wiser than you, he said at last. He already knows what you kings have yet to learn. That it is not Tarascus, nor Valerius, no, nor Amalric, but Zaltotun, who is the real master of the western nations. They did not reply. They sat staring at him, assailed by a numbing realization of the truth of his assertion. "'There is no road for me but the Imperial Highway,' said Zaltotun. "'But first we must crush Conan. I do not know how he escaped me at Belveris, for knowledge of what happened while I lay in the slumber of the Black Lotus is denied me. But he is in the south gathering an army.' It is his last desperate blow, made possible only by the desperation of the people who have suffered under Valerius. Let them rise. I hold them all in the palm of my hand. We will wait until he moves against us, and then we will crush him once and for all. Then we shall crush Pointain and Gunderland and the stupid Bossonians. After them, Ophir. Argos, Zingara, Koth, all the nations of the world we shall wield into one vast empire. You shall rule as my satraps, and as my captains shall be greater than kings are now. I am unconquerable, for the heart of Ahriman is hidden where no man can ever wield it against me again. Tarascus averted his gaze lest Zaltotun read his thoughts. He knew the wizard had not looked into the golden chest with its carven serpents that had seemed to sleep since he laid the heart therein. Strange as it seemed, Zaltotun did not know that the heart had been stolen. The strange jewel was beyond or outside the ring of his dark wisdom. His uncanny talents did not warn him that the chest was empty. Tarascus did not believe that Zaltotun knew the full extent of Arastus's revelations, for the Pythonian had not mentioned the restoration of Acheron, but only the building of a new earthly empire. Tarascus did not believe that Zaltotun was yet quite sure of his power. If they needed his aid in their ambitions, no less he needed theirs. Magic depended, to a certain extent, after all, on sword strokes and lance thrusts. The king read meaning in Almalric's furtive glance. Let the wizard use his arts to help them defeat their most dangerous enemy. Time enough then 
to turn against him. There might yet be a way to cheat this dark power they had raised. End of chapter 20、Chapter、Chapter Twenty-One Drums of Peril. Confirmation of the war came when the army of Poitain, ten thousand strong, marched through the southern passes with waving banners and shimmer of steel, and at their head the spy swore, rode a giant figure in black armor with the royal line of Aquilonia worked in gold upon the breast of his rich silken surcoat. Conan lived. The king lived. There was no doubt of it in men's minds now, whether friend or foe. With the news of the invasion from the south, there also came word, brought by hard-riding couriers, that the host of Gundermen was moving southward, reinforced by the barons of the northwest and the northern Bosonians. Tarascus marched with thirty-one thousand men to Galparan on the river Shiki. Which the Gundermen must cross to strike at the towns still held by the Nemedians. The Shiki was a swift, turbulent river, rushing southwestward through rocky gorges and canyons, and there were few places where an army could cross at that time of the year when the stream was almost bank full with the melting of the snows. All the country east of Shiki was in the hands of the Nemedians. And it was logical to assume that the Gundermen would attempt to cross either at Galparan or Tanasol, which lay to the south of Galparan. Reinforcements were daily expected from Nemedia, until word came that the king of Ophir was making hostile demonstrations on Nemedia's southern border, and to spare any more troops would be to expose Nemedia to the risk of an invasion from the south. Amalric and Valerius moved out from Tarantia with twenty-five thousand men, leaving as large a garrison as they dared to discourage revolts in the cities during their absence. They wished to meet and crush Conan before he could be joined by the rebellious forces of the kingdom. The king and his Poitanians had crossed the mountains. But there had been no actual clash of arms, no attack on towns or fortresses. Conan had appeared and disappeared. Apparently, he had turned westward through the wild, thinly settled hill country, and entered the Bosonian marches, gathering recruits as he went. Amalric and Valerius, with their host, Nemedians, Aquilonian renegades, and ferocious mercenaries. Moved through the land in baffled wrath, looking for a foe which did not appear. Amalric found it impossible to obtain more than vague general tidings about Conan's movements. Scouting parties had a way of riding out and never returning, and it was not uncommon to find a spy crucified to an oak. The countryside was up and striking as peasants and country folk strike, savagely, murderously, and secretly. All that Amalric knew certainly was that a large force of Gundermen and northern Bosonians was somewhere to the north of him, beyond the Shiki, and that Conan, with a smaller force of Pointanians and southern Bosonians, was somewhere to the southwest of him. He began to grow fearful that if he and Valerius advanced further into the wild country, Conan might elude them entirely, march around them, and invade the central provinces behind them. Amalric fell back to the Shiki Valley, and camped in a plain a day's ride from Tanasol. There he waited. Tarascus maintained his position at Galparan, for he feared that Conan's maneuvers were intended to draw him southward, and so let the Gundermen into the kingdom at the northern crossing. To Amalric's camp came Zaltotun in his chariot, drawn by the uncanny horses that never tired, and he entered Amalric's tent, where the baron conferred with Valerius over a map spread on an ivory camp table. This map Zaltotun crumpled and flung aside. "What your scouts cannot learn for you," quoth he, "my spies tell me." 
though their information is strangely blurred and imperfect as if unseen forces were working against me conan is advancing along the sheer key river with ten thousand poitanians three thousand southern bosonians and barons of the west and south with their retainers to the number of five thousand an army of thirty thousand gundermen and northern bosonians is pushing southward to join him they have established contact by means of secret communications used by the cursed priest of asura who seemed to be opposing me and whom i will feed to a serpent when the battle is over i swear it by set both armies are headed for the crossing at tanasul but i do not believe that the gundermen will cross the river i believe that conan will cross instead and join them why should conan cross the river because it is to his advantage to delay the battle the longer he waits the stronger he will become the more precarious our position the hills on the other side of the river swarm with people passionately loyal to his cause broken men refugees fugitives from valerius's cruelty from all over the kingdom men are hurrying to join his army singly and by companies daily parties from our armies are ambushed and cut to pieces by the country folk revolt grows in the central provinces and will soon burst into open rebellion the garrisons we left there are not sufficient and we can hope for no reinforcements from nemedia for the time being i see the hand of polentides in this brawling on the ophirian border he has kin in ophir if we do not catch and crush conan quickly the provinces will be in a blaze of revolt behind us we shall have to fall back to tarantia to defend what we have taken and we may have to fight our way through a country in rebellion with conan's whole force at our heels and then stand siege in the city itself with enemies within as well as without no we cannot wait we must crush conan before his army grows too great before the central provinces rise with his head hanging above the gate of tarantia you will see how quickly the rebellion will fall apart why do you not put a spell on his army to slay them all asked valerius half in mockery Zaltotun stared at the aquilonian as if he read the full extent of the mocking madness that lurked in those wayward eyes do not worry he said at last my arts shall crush conan finally like a lizard under the heel but even sorcery is aided by pikes and swords if he crosses the river and takes up his position at the goralian hills he may be hard to dislodge said almaric but if we catch him in the valley on this side of the river we can wipe him out how far is conan from tanasol at the rate he is marching he should reach the crossing some time tomorrow night his men are rugged and he is pushing them hard he should arrive there at least a day before the gundermen good amalric smote the table with his clenched fist i can reach tanasol before he can i'll send riders to tarascus bidding him to follow me to tanasol by the time he arrives i will have cut conan off from the crossing and destroyed him then our combined force can cross the river and deal with the gundermen saltotun shook his head impatiently a good plan if you were dealing with anyone but conan but your twenty-five thousand men are not enough to destroy his eighteen thousand before the gundermen come up they will fight with the desperation of wounded panthers and suppose the gundermen come up while the hosts are locked in battle you will be caught between two fires and destroyed before Tarascus can arrive. He will reach Tanasol too late to aid you. What then? demanded Amalric. Move with your whole strength against Conan, answered the man from Acheron. Send a rider bidding Tarascus join us here. We will wait his coming. Then we will march together to Tanasol. But while we wait, protested Amalric. Conan will cross the river and join the Gundermen. Conan will not cross the river, answered Zaltotun. Amalric's head jerked up, and he stared into the cryptic dark eyes. 
What do you mean? Suppose there were torrential rains far to the north, at the head of the Shirki. Suppose the river came down in such flood as to render the crossing at Tanasol impassable. Could we not then bring up our entire force at our leisure, catch Conan on this side of the river and crush him, and then, when the flood subsided, which I think it would do the next day, could we not cross the river and destroy the Gunderman? Thus we could use our full strength against each of the smaller forces in turn. Valerius laughed, as he always laughed, at the prospect of the ruin of either friend or foe and drew a restless hand jerkily through his unruly yellow locks. Amalric stared at the man from Acheron with mingled fear and admiration. If we caught Conan in Shirki Valley with the hill ridges to his right and the river in flood to his left, he admitted, with our whole force we could annihilate him. Do you think, are you sure, do you believe such rains will fall? I go to my tent, answered Zaltotun, rising. Necromancy is not accomplished by the waving of a wand. Send a rider to Tarascus, and let none approach my tent. That last command was unnecessary. No man in that host could have been bribed to approach that mysterious black silken pavilion, the door flaps of which were always closely drawn. None but Zaltotun ever entered it, yet voices were often heard issuing from it. Its walls billowed sometimes without a wind, and weird music came from it. Sometimes, deep in midnight, its silken walls were lit red by flames flickering within, liming misshapen silhouettes that passed to and fro. Lying in his own tent that night, Amalric heard the steady rumble of a drum in Zaltotun's tent. Through the darkness it boomed steadily, and occasionally the Nemedian could have sworn that a deep, croaking voice mingled with the pulse of the drum, and he shuddered, for he knew that voice was not the voice of Zaltotun. The drum rustled and murmured on like deep thunder, heard far off, and before dawn, Amalric, glancing from his tent, caught the red flicker of lightning afar on the northern horizon. In all other parts of the sky the great stars blazed whitely. But the distant lightning flickered incessantly, like the crimson glint of firelight on a tiny turning blade. At sunset of the next day, Tarascus came up with his host, dusty and weary from hard marching the footmen straggling hours behind the horsemen. They camped in the plain near Amalric's camp, and at dawn the combined army moved westward. Ahead of him roved a swarm of scouts, and Amalric waited impatiently for them to return and tell of the Potanians trapped beside a furious flood. But when the scouts met the column, it was with the news that Conan had crossed the river. What? exclaimed Amalric. Did he cross before the flood? There was no flood, answered the scouts, puzzled. Late last night he came up to Tanasol and flung his army across. No flood? exclaimed Zaltotun, taken aback for the first time in Amalric's knowledge. Impossible! There were mighty rains upon the headwaters of the Shirki last night and the night before that. That may be, your lordship answered the scout. It is true the waters are muddy, and the people of Tanasol said that the river rose perhaps a foot yesterday, but that was not enough to prevent Conan's crossing. Zaltotun's sorcery had failed. The thought hammered in Amalric's brain. His horror of this strange man out of the past had grown steadily since that night in Belverus, when he had seen a brown, shriveled mummy swell and grow into a living man. And the death of Erastes had changed lurking horror into active fear. In his heart was a grisly conviction that the man, or devil, was invincible. Yet... Now he had undeniable proof of his failure. 
yet even the greatest of necromancers might fail occasionally thought the baron at any rate he dared not oppose the man from acheron yet orestes was dead writhing in mithra only knew what nameless hell and amalric knew his sword would scarcely prevail where the black wisdom of the renegade priest had failed what grisly abomination his altotune plotted lay in the unpredictable future conan and his host were a present menace against which Zaltotun's wizardry might well be needed before the play was all played they came to tanasul a small fortified village at the spot where a reef of rocks made a natural bridge across the river passable always except in times of greatest flood scouts brought in news that conan had taken up his position in the garalian hills which began to rise a few miles beyond the river and just before sundown the gundermen had arrived in his camp amalric looked at xaltotun inscrutable and alien in the light of the flaring torches night had fallen what now your magic has failed conan confronts us with an army nearly as strong as our own and he has the advantage of position we have a choice of two evils to camp here and await his attack or to fall back toward tarantia and await reinforcements we are ruined if we wait answered saltotun cross the river and camp on the plain we will attack at dawn but his position is too strong exclaimed amalric fool a gust of passion broke the veneer of the wizard's calm have you forgotten valkia because some obscure elemental principle prevented the flood do you deem me helpless i had intended that your spears should exterminate our enemies but do not fear it is my arts that shall crush their host conan is in a trap he will never see another sun set cross the river they crossed by the flare of torches the hoofs of the horses clinked on the rocky bridge splashed through the shallows the glint of torches on shields and breastplates was reflected redly in the black water the rock bridge was broad on which they crossed but even so it was past midnight before the host was camped in the plain beyond above them they could see fires winking redly in the distance conan had turned at bay in the garalian hills which had more than once before served as the last stand of an aquilonian king amalric left his pavilion and strode restlessly through the camp a weird glow flickered in zaltotun's tent and from time to time a demoniacal cry slashed the silence and there was a low sinister muttering of a drum that rustled rather than rumbled amalric his instincts whetted by the night and the circumstances felt that zaltotun was opposed by more than physical force doubts of the wizard's power assailed him he glanced at the fires high above him and his face set in grim lines he and his army were deep in the midst of a hostile country up there among those hills lurked thousands of wolfish figures out of whose hearts and souls all emotion and hope had been scourged except a frenzied hate for their conquerors a mad lust for vengeance defeat meant annihilation retreat through a land swarming with blood-mad enemies and on the morrow he must hurl his host against the grimmest fighter in the western nations and his desperate horde if saltotun failed them now half a dozen men-at-arms strode out of the shadows the firelight glinted on their breastplates and helmet crests among them they half led half dragged a gaunt figure in tattered rags saluting they spoke my lord this man came to the outpost and said he desired word with king valerius he is an aquilonian he looked more like a wolf a wolf the traps had scarred old sores that only fetters make showed on his wrists and ankles 
a great brand the mark of hot iron disfigured his face his eyes glared through the tangle of his matted hair as he half crouched before the baron who are you you filthy dog demanded the nemedian call me tiberius answered the man and his teeth clicked in an involuntary spasm i have come to tell you how to trap conan a traitor eh rumbled the baron men say you have gold mouthed the man shivering under his rags give some to me uh, give me gold and i will show you how to defeat the king his eyes glazed widely his outstretched upturned hands were spread like quivering claws amalric shrugged his shoulder in distaste but no tool was too base for his use if you speak the truth you shall have more gold than you can carry he said if you are a liar and a spy i will have you crucified head down bring him along in the tent of valerius the baron pointed to the man who crouched shivering before them huddling his rags about him he says he knows a way to aid us on the morrow we will need his aid if zaltotun's plan is no better than it has proved so far speak on dog the man's body writhed in strange convulsions. Words came in a stumbling rush. Conan camps at the head of the valley of lions. It is shaped like a fan, with steep hills on either side. If you attack him tomorrow, you will have to march straight up the valley. You cannot climb the hills on either side. But if King Valerius will deign to accept my service, I will guide him through the hills and show him how he can come upon king conan from behind but if it is to be done at all we must start soon it is many hours riding for one must go miles to the west then uh, miles to the north then turn eastward and so come into the valley of lions from behind as the gunderman came amalric hesitated tucking his chin in these chaotic times it was not rare to find men willing to sell their souls for a few gold pieces if you lead me astray you will die said valerius you are aware of that are you not the man shivered but his wide eyes did not waver if i betray you slay me conan will not dare divide his force mused amalric he will need all his men to repel our attack he cannot spare any to lay ambushes in the hills besides this fellow knows his hide depends on his leading you as he promised would a dog like him sacrifice himself nonsense no valerius i believe the man is honest or a greater thief than most for he would sell his liberator laughed valerius very well i will follow the dog how many men can you spare me five thousand should be enough answered amalric a surprise attack on their rear will throw them into confusion and that will be enough i shall expect your attack about noon you will know when i strike answered valerius as amalric returned to his pavilion he noted with gratification that zaltotun was still in his tent to judge from the blood-freezing cries that shuddered forth into the night air from time to time when presently he heard the clink of steel and the jingle of bridles in the outer darkness he smiled again valerius had about served his purpose the baron knew that conan was like a wounded lion that rends and tears even in his death throes when valerius struck from the rear the desperate strokes of the cimmerian might well wipe his rival out of existence before he himself succumbed so much the better amalric felt he could dispense with valerius once he had paved the way for a nemedian victory the five thousand horsemen who accompanied valerius were hard-bitten apollonian renegades for the most part in the still starlight they moved out of the sleeping camp following the westward trend of the great black masses that rose against the stars ahead of them valerius rode at their head and beside him rode tiberius a leather thong about his wrist gripped by a man-at-arms who rode on the other side of him 
others kept close behind with drawn swords play us false and you die instantly valerius pointed out i do not know every sheep path in these hills but i know enough about the general configuration of the country to know the directions we must take to come in behind the valley of lions see that you do not lead us astray the man ducked his head and his teeth chattered as he volubly assured his captor of his loyalty staring up stupidly at the banner that floated over him the golden serpent of the old dynasty skirting the extremities of the hills that locked the valley of lions they swung wide to the west an hour's ride and they turned north forging through wild and rugged hills following dim trails and tortuous paths sunrise found them some miles northwest of conan's position and here the guide turned eastward and led them through a maze of labyrinths and crags valerius nodded judging their position by various peaks thrusting up above the others he had kept his bearings in a general way and he knew they were still headed in the right direction but now without warning a gray fleecy mass came billowing down from the north veiling the slopes spreading out through the valleys it blotted out the sun the world became a blind gray void in which visibility was limited to a matter of yards advance became a stumbling groping muddle valerius cursed he could no longer see the peaks that had served him as guideposts he must depend wholly upon the traitorous guide the golden serpent drooped in the windless air presently tiberius seemed himself confused he halted stared about uncertainly are you lost dog demanded valerius harshly listen somewhere ahead of them a faint vibration began the rhythmic rumble of a drum conan's drum exclaimed the aquilonian if we are close enough to hear the drum said valerius why do we not hear the shouts and the clang of arms surely battle has joined the gorges and the winds play strange tricks answered tiberius his teeth chattering with the ague that is frequently the lot of men who have spent much time in damp underground dungeons listen faintly to their ears came a low muffled roar they are fighting down in the valley cried tiberius the drum is beating on the heights let us hasten he rode straight on toward the sound of the distant drum as one who knows his ground at last valerius followed cursing the fog then it occurred to him that it would mask his advance conan could not see him coming he would be at the Sumerian's back before the noonday sun dispelled the mists. Just now he could not tell what lay on either hand, whether cliffs, thickets, or gorges. The drum throbbed unceasingly, growing louder as they advanced, but they heard no more of the battle. Valerius had no idea toward what point of the compass they were headed. He started as he saw gray rock walls looming through the smoky drifts on either hand and realized that they were riding through a narrow defile but the guide showed no sign of nervousness and valerius hove a sigh of relief when the walls widened out and became invisible in the fog they were through the defile if an ambush had been planned it would have been made in that pass but now tiberius halted again the drum was rumbling louder and valerius could not determine from what direction the sound was coming now it seemed ahead of him now behind now on one hand or the other valerius glared about him impatiently sitting on his war-horse with wisps of mist curling about him and the moisture gleaming on his armor Behind him the long line of steel-clad riders faded away and away like phantoms into the mist. "'Why do you tarry, dog?' he demanded. The man seemed to be listening to the ghostly drum. Slowly he straightened in his saddle, turned his head, and faced Valerius, and the smile on his lips was terrible to see. 
The fog is thinning, Valerius, he said in a new voice, pointing a bony finger. Look. The drum was silent. The fog was fading away. First the crest of cliffs came in sight above the gray clouds, tall and spectral. Lower and lower crawled the mists, shrinking, fading. Valerius started up in his stirrup with a cry that the horsemen echoed behind him. On all sides of them the cliffs towered. They were not in a wide open valley as he had supposed. They were in a blind gorge walled by sheer cliffs hundreds of feet high. The only entrance or exit was that narrow defile through which they had ridden. Dog! Valerius struck Tiberius full in the mouth with his clenched, mailed hand. What devil's trick is this? Tiberius spat out a mouthful of blood and shook with fearful laughter. <laughs> a trick that shall rid the world of a beast. Look, dog! Again Valerius cried out, more in fury than in fear. The defile was blocked by a wild and terrible band of men who stood silent as images. Ragged, shock-headed men with spears in their hands, hundreds of them. And up on the cliffs appeared other faces, thousands of faces, wild, gaunt, ferocious faces, marked by fire and steel and starvation. A trick of Conan's, raged Valerius. Ha! <laughs> Conan knows nothing of it, laughed Tiberius. It was the plot of broken men, of men you ruined and turned to beasts. Amalric was right. Conan has not divided his army. We are the rabble who followed him, the wolves who skulked in these hills, the homeless men, the hopeless men. This was our plan, and the priests of Asura aided us with their mist. Look at them, Valerius. Each bears the mark of your hand, on his body or on his heart. Look at me. Do you not know me? Do you? What of this scar your hangman burned upon me? Once you knew me. Once I was lord of Amelius, the man whose sons you murdered, whose daughters your mercenaries ravished and slew. You said I would not sacrifice myself to trap you? Oh, mighty gods! If I had a thousand lives, I would give them all to buy your doom. And I have bought it. Look on the men you broke, dead men who once played the king. Their hour has come. This gorge is your tomb. Try to climb the cliffs. They are steep. They are high. Try to fight your way back through the defile. Spears will block your path. Boulders will crush you from above. Dog, I will be waiting for you in hell. Throwing back his head, he laughed until the rocks rang. Valerius leaned from his saddle and slashed down with his great sword, severing shoulder bone and breast. Tiberius sank to the earth still laughing ghastily through a gurgle of gushing blood the drums had begun again encircling the gorge with guttural thunder boulders came crashing down above the screams of dying men shrilled the arrows in blinding clouds from the cliffs end of chapter 21《Chapter Twenty Two of the Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two, The Last Chapter, The Road to Acheron. Dawn was just whitening the east when Amalric drew up his hosts in the mouth of the Valley of Lions. This valley was flanked by low, rolling but steep hills and the floor pitched upward in a series of irregular natural terraces. On the uppermost of these terraces, Conan's army held its position, awaiting the attack. The host that had joined him, marching down from Gunderland, had not been composed exclusively of spearmen. 
with them had come seven thousand bassonian archers and four thousand barons and their retainers of the north and west swelling the ranks of his cavalry the pikemen were drawn up in a compact wedge-shaped formation at the narrow head of the valley there were nineteen thousand of them mostly gundermen though some four thousand were aquilonians of other provinces they were flanked on either hand by five thousand bossonian archers behind the ranks of the pikemen the knights sat their steeds motionless lances raised ten thousand knights of poitain nine thousand aquilonians barons and their retainers it was a strong position his flanks could not be turned for that would mean climbing the steep wooded hills in the teeth of the arrows and swords of the bossonians his camp lay directly behind him in a narrow steep-walled valley which was indeed merely a continuation of the valley of lions pitching up at a higher level he did not fear a surprise from the rear because the hills behind him were full of refugees and broken men whose loyalty to him was beyond question but if his position was hard to shake it was equally hard to escape from it was a trap as well as a fortress for the defenders a desperate last stand of men who did not expect to survive unless they were victorious the only line of retreat possible was through the narrow valley at their rear zaltotun mounted a hill on the left side of the valley near the wide mouth this hill rose higher than the others and was known as the king's altar for a reason long forgotten only zaltotun knew and his memory dated back three thousand years he was not alone his two familiars silent hairy furtive and dark were with him and they bore a young aquilonian girl bound hand and foot they laid her on the ancient stone which was curiously like an altar and which crowned the summit of the hill for long centuries it had stood there worn by the elements until many doubted that it was anything but a curiously shaped natural rock but what it was and why it stood there zaltotun remembered from of old the familiars went away with their bent backs like silent gnomes and zaltotun stood alone beside the altar his dark beard blown in the wind overlooking the valley he could see clear back to the winding shirki and up into the hills beyond the head of the valley he could see the gleaming wedge of steel drawn up at the head of the terraces the burgonets of the archers glinting among the rocks and bushes the silent knights motionless on their steeds their pennons flowing above their helmets their lances rising in a bristling thicket Looking in the other direction, he could see the long, serried ranks of the Nemedians moving in ranks of shining steel into the mouth of the valley. Behind them the gay pavilions of the lords and knights and the drab tents of the common soldiers stretched back almost to the river. Like a river of molten steel, the Nemedian host flowed into the valley, the great scarlet dragon rippling over it first marched the bowmen in even ranks arbalests half raised bolts knocked fingers on triggers after them came the pikemen and behind them the real strength of the army the mounted knights their banners unfurled in the wind their lances lifted walking their great steeds forward as if they rode to a banquet and higher up on the slopes the smaller aquilonian host stood grimly silent there were thirty thousand nemedian knights and as in most hyborian nations it was the chivalry which was the sword of the army the footmen were used only to clear the way for a charge of the armored knights there were twenty-one thousand of these pikemen and archers the bowmen began loosing as they advanced without breaking ranks launching their quarrels with a whirr and tang but the bolts fell short or rattled harmlessly from the overlapping shields of the gundermen and before the arbalesters could come within killing range the arching shafts of the bosonian were wreaking havoc in their ranks a little of this a futile attempt at exchanging fire and the nemedian bowmen began falling back in disorder 
their armor was light their weapons no match for the bosonian longbows the western archers were sheltered by bushes and rocks moreover the nemedian footmen lacked something of the morale of the horsemen knowing as they did that they were being used merely to clear the way for the knights the crossbowmen fell back and between their opening lines the pikemen advanced these were largely mercenaries and their masters had no compunction about sacrificing them they were intended to mask the advance of the knights until the latter were within smiting distance so while the arbalesters plied their bolts from either flank at long range the pikemen marched into the teeth of the blast from above and behind them the knights came on when the pikemen began to falter beneath the savage hail of death that whistled down the slopes among them a trumpet blew their companies divided to right and left and through them the mailed knights thundered they ran into a cloud of stinging death the cloth yard shafts found every crevice in their armor and the housings of the steeds horses scrambling up the grassy terraces reared and plunged backward bearing their riders with them steel-clad forms littered the slopes the charge wavered and ebbed back back down in the valley amalric reformed his ranks tarascus was fighting with drawn sword under the scarlet dragon but it was the baron of tor who commanded that day amalric swore as he glanced at the forest of lance tips visible above and beyond the headpieces of the gundermen he had hoped his retirement would draw the knights out in a charge down the slopes after him to be raked from either side by his bowmen and swamped by the numbers of his horsemen but they had not moved camp servants brought skins of water from the river knights doffed their helmets and drenched their sweating heads the wounded on the slopes screamed vainly for water in the upper valley spring supplied the defenders they did not thirst that long hot spring day on the king's altar beside the ancient carven stone saltotun watched the steel tide ebb and flow on came the knights with waving plumes and dipping lances through a whistling cloud of arrows they ploughed to break like a thundering wave on the bristling wall of spears and shields axes rose and fell above the plumed helmets spears thrust upward bringing down horses and riders the pride of the gundermen was no less fierce than that of the knights they were not spear fodder to be sacrificed for the glory of better men they were the finest infantry in the world with the tradition that made their morale unshakable the kings of aquilonia had long learned the worth of unbreakable infantry they held their formation unshaken over their gleaming ranks flowed the great lion banner and at the tip of the wedge a giant figure in black armor roared and smote like a hurricane with a dripping axe that split steel and bone alike the Nemedians fought as gallantly as their traditions of high courage demanded but they could not break the iron wedge and from the wooded knolls on either hand arrows raked their close-packed ranks mercilessly their own bowmen were useless their pikemen unable to climb the heights and come to grips with the bosonians slowly stubbornly sullenly the grim knights fell back counting their empty saddles above them the gundermen made no outcry of triumph they closed their ranks locking up the gaps made by the fallen sweat ran into their eyes from under their steel caps they gripped their spears and waited their fierce hearts swelling with pride that a king should fight on foot with them behind them the aquilonian knights had not moved they sat their steeds grimly immobile a knight spurred a sweating horse up the hill called the king's altar and glared at Zaltotun with bitter eyes. Amalric bids me say that it is time to use your magic wizard, he said. We are dying like flies down there in the valley. We cannot break their ranks. Zaltotun seemed to expand, to grow tall and awesome and terrible. Return to Amalric, 
he said tell him to reform his ranks for a charge but to await my signal before that signal is given he will see a sight that he will remember until he lies dying the knight saluted as if compelled against his will and thundered down the hill at breakneck pace Zaltotun stood beside the dark altar stone and stared across the valley at the dead and wounded men on the terraces at the grim blood-stained band at the head of the slopes at the dusty steel-clad ranks reforming in the vale below he glanced up at the sky and he glanced down at the slim white figure on the dark stone and lifting a dagger inlaid with archaic hieroglyphs he intoned an immemorial invocation set god of darkness scaly lord of shadows by the blood of a virgin and the sevenfold symbol i call to your sons below the black earth children of the deeps below the red earth under the black earth awaken and shake your awful manes let the hills rock and the stones topple upon my enemies let the sky grow dark above them and earth unstable beneath their feet let a wind from the deep black earth curl up beneath their feet and blacken and shrivel them he halted short dagger lifted in the tense silence the roar of the hosts rose beneath him borne on the wind on the other side of the altar stood a man in a black hooded robe whose coif shadowed pale delicate features and dark eyes calm and meditative dog of asura whispered zaltotun his voice was like the hiss of an angered serpent are you mad that you seek your doom ho baal chiron call again dog of Acheron, said the other and laughed summon them loudly they do not hear unless your shouts reverberate in hell from a thicket on the edge of the crest came a somber old woman in peasant garb her hair flowing over her shoulders a great gray wolf following at her heels witch priest and wolf muttered zaltotun grimly and laughed <laughs> fools to pit your charlatan's mummery against my arts with a wave of my hand i brush you from my path your arts are straws in the wind dog of python answered the asurian have you wondered why the shirki did not come down in flood and trap conan on the other bank when i saw the lightning in the night i guessed your plan and my spells dispersed the clouds you had summoned before they could empty their torrents you did not even know that your rain-making wizardry had failed you lie cried saltotun but the confidence in his voice was shaken i have felt the impact of a powerful sorcery against mine but no man on earth could undo the rain magic once made unless you possess the very heart of sorcery but the flood you plotted did not come to pass answered the priest look at your allies in the valley pythonian you have led them to slaughter they are caught in the fangs of the trap and you cannot aid them look he pointed out of the narrow gorge of the upper valley behind the pointanians a horseman came flying whirling something about his head that flashed in the sun recklessly he hurtled down the slopes through the ranks of the gundermen who sent up a deep-throated roar and clashed their spears and shields like thunder in the hills on the terraces between the hosts the sweat-soaked horse reared and plunged and his wild rider yelled and brandished the thing in his hands like one demented it was the torn remnant of a scarlet banner and the sun struck dazzlingly on the golden scales of a serpent that writhed thereon valerius is dead cried hadrathus ringingly a fog and a drum lured him to his doom i gathered that fog dog of python and i dispersed it i with my magic 
which is greater than your magic. What matters it? roared Zaltotun, a terrible sight, his eyes blazing, his features convulsed. Valerius was a fool. I do not need him. I can crush Conan without human aid. Why have you delayed? mocked Hadrathus. Why have you allowed so many of your allies to fall, pierced by arrows and spitted on spears? Because blood aids great sorcery, thundered Zaltotun in a voice that made the rocks quiver. A lurid nimbus played about his awful head. Because no wizard wastes his strength thoughtlessly. Because I would conserve my powers for the great days to be, rather than employ them in a hill country brawl. But now, by set, I shall loose them to the uttermost. Watch, dog of a Sora, false priest of an outworn god. See a sight that shall blast your reason for evermore. Hadrathus threw back his head and laughed, and hell was in his laughter. Ha, <laughs> ha, look, black devil of Python. His hand came from under his robe, holding something that flamed and burned in the sun, changing the light to a pulsing golden glow in which the flesh of Zaltotun looked like the flesh of a corpse. Zaltotun cried out as if he had been stabbed. The, the heart, the heart of Araman. Aye, the one power that is greater than your power. Zaltotun seemed to shrivel, to grow old. Suddenly his beard was shot with snow, his locks flecked with gray. The heart, he mumbled. You stole it, dog, thief. Not I. It has been on a long journey far to the southward. But now it is in my hands, and your black arts cannot stand against it. As it resurrected you, so shall it hurl you back into the night whence it drew you. You shall go down the dark road to Acheron, which is the road of silence and the night. The dark empire unreborn shall remain a legend and a black memory. Conan shall reign again, and the heart of Ardaman shall go back into the cavern below the temple of Mitra to burn as a symbol of the power of Aquilonia for a thousand years. Zaltotun screamed inhumanly and rushed around the altar, dagger lifted. But from somewhere, out of the sky perhaps, or the great jewel that blazed in the hand of Hadrathus, shot a jutting beam of blinding blue light. Full against the breast of Zaltotun it flashed, and the hills re-echoed the concussion. The wizard of Acheron went down as though struck by a thunderbolt, and before he touched the ground he was fearfully altered. Beside the altar stone lay no fresh slain corpse, but a shriveled mummy, a brown, dry, unrecognizable carcass sprawling among moldering swathings. Somberly, old Zelata looked down. He was not a living man she said. The heart lent him a false aspect of life that deceived even himself. I never saw him as other than a mummy. Hydrathus bent to unbind the swooning girl on the altar, when from among the trees appeared a strange apparition. Saltotun's chariot drawn by the weird horses. Silently they advanced to the altar and halted, with the chariot wheel almost touching the brown, withered thing on the grass. Hadrathus lifted the body of the wizard and placed it in the chariot. And without hesitation the uncanny steeds turned and moved off southward down the hill, and Hadrathus and Zelata and the grey wolf watched them go, down the long road to Acheron, which is beyond the kin of men. Down in the valley, Almari had stiffened in his saddle when he saw that wild horseman curveting and caracoling on the slopes while he brandished that blood-stained serpent banner. Then some instinct jerked his head about, toward the hill known as the King's Altar, 
and his lips parted. Every man in the valley saw it, an arcing shaft of dazzling light that towered up from the summit of the hill, showering gold and fire. High above the host it burst in a blinding blaze that momentarily paled the sun. "'That's not Zaltotun's signal,' roared the baron. "'No!' shouted Tarasus. "'It's a signal to the Aquilonians. Look!' Above them the immobile ranks were moving at last, and a deep-throated roar thundered across the vale. "'Zoltotun has failed us!' bellowed Amalric furiously. "'Valerius has failed us! We have been led into a trap! Mithras, curse on Zoltotun who led us here! Sound the retreat!' "'Too late!' yelled Taraskus. "'Look!' Up on the slopes the forest of lances dipped, leveled. The ranks of the gundermen rolled back to right and left like a parting curtain, and with a thunder like the rising roar of a hurricane, the knights of Aquilonia crashed down the slopes. The impetus of that charge was irresistible. Bolts driven by the demoralized arbalesters glanced from their shields, their bent helmets. Their plumes and pennons streamed out behind them, their lances lowered, they swept over the wavering lines of pikemen and roared down the slopes like a wave. Amalric yelled an order to charge, and the Nemedians, with desperate courage, spurred their horses at the slopes. They still outnumbered the attackers, but they were weary men on tired horses charging uphill. The onrushing knights had not struck a blow that day. Their horses were fresh. They were coming downhill, and they came like a thunderbolt. And, like a thunderbolt, they smote the struggling ranks of the Nemedians, smote them, split them apart, ripped them asunder, and dashed the remnants headlong down the slopes. After them, on foot, came the Gundermen, blood-mad, and the Bosonians were swarming down the hills, loosing as they ran at every foe that still moved. Down the slopes washed the tide of battle. The dazed Nemedians swept on the crest of the wave. Their archers had thrown down their arbalests and were fleeing. Such pikemen as had survived the blasting charge of the knights were cut to pieces by the ruthless gundermen. In a wild confusion the battle swept through the wide mouth of the valley and into the plain beyond. All over the plain swarmed the warriors, fleeing and pursuing broken into single combat in clumps of smiting, hacking knights on rearing, wheeling horses. But the Nemedians were smashed, broken, unable to reform or make a stand. By the hundreds they broke away, spurring for the river. Many reached it, rushed across, and rode eastward. The countryside was up behind them. The people hunted them like wolves. Few ever reached Tarantia. The final break did not come until the fall of Amalric. The baron, striving in vain to rally his men, rode straight at the clump of knights that followed the giant in black armor, whose surcoat bore the royal lion, and over whose head floated the golden lion banner with the scarlet leopard of Pointaine beside it. A tall warrior in gleaming armor couched his lance and charged to meet the lord of Tor. They met like a thunderclap. The Nemedian's lance, striking his foe's helmet, snapped bolts and rivets and tore off the cask, revealing the features of Polentides. But the Aquilonian's lance head crashed through the shield and breastplate to transfix the baron's heart. A roar went up as Amalric was hurled from his saddle, snapping the lance that impaled him, and the Nemedians gave way as a barrier bursts under the surging impact of a tidal wave. They rode for the river in a blind stampede that swept the plain like a whirlwind. The hour of the dragon had passed. Tarascus did not flee. Amalric was dead, the color-bearer slain, and the royal Nemedian banner trampled in the blood and dust. Most of his knights were fleeing, and the Apollonians were riding them down. Tarascus knew the day was lost. But with a handful of faithful followers, he ranged through the melee, conscious of but one desire, to meet Conan the Cimmerian. And at last he met him. Formations had been destroyed utterly, close-knit bands broken asunder and swept apart. 
the crest of Tercero gleamed in one part of the plain, those of Prospero and Palantides in others. Conan was alone. The house troops of Tarascus had fallen one by one. The two kings met man to man. Even as they rode at each other, the horse of Tarascus sobbed and sank under him. Conan leaped from his own steed and ran at him as the king of Nemedia disengaged himself and rose. Steel flashed blindingly in the sun, clashed loudly, and blue sparks flew. Then a clang of armor as Tarascus measured his full length on the earth beneath a thunderous stroke of Conan's broadsword. The Cimmerian placed a mail-shod foot on his enemy's breast and lifted his sword. His helmet was gone. He shook back his black mane, and his blue eyes blazed with their old fire. "'Do you yield?' "'Will you give me quarter?' demanded the Nemedian. "'Aye, better than you'd have given me, you dog. Life for you and all your men who throw down their arms. Though I ought to split your head for an infernal thief,' the Cimmerian added. Tarascus twisted his neck and glared over the plain. The remnants of the Nemedian host were flying across the stone bridge with swarms of victorious Aquilonians at their heels, smiting with fury of glutted vengeance. Bossonians and Gundermen were swarming through the camp of their enemies, tearing the tents to pieces in search of plunder, seizing prisoners, ripping open the baggage, and upsetting the wagons. Tarascus cursed fervently and then shrugged his shoulders as well as he could under the circumstances. "'Very well. I have no choice. What are your demands?' "'Surrender to me all your present holdings in Aquilonia. Order your garrisons to march out of the castles and towns they hold without their arms, and get your infernal armies out of Aquilonia as quickly as possible. In addition, you shall return all Aquilonians sold as slaves, and pay an indemnity to be designated later, when the damage your occupation of the country has caused has been properly estimated. You will remain as hostage until these terms have been carried out. Very well, surrendered Taraskus. I will surrender all the castles and towns now held by my garrisons without resistance, and all the other things shall be done. What ransom for my body? Conan laughed and removed his foot from his foe's steel-clad breast, grasped his shoulder and heaved him to his feet. He started to speak, then turned to see Hadrathus approaching him. The priest was as calm and self-possessed as ever, picking his way between rows of dead men and horses. Conan wiped the sweat-smeared dust from his face with a blood-stained hand. He had fought all through the day, first on foot with the pikemen, then in the saddle leading the charge. His surcoat was gone, his armor splashed with blood and battered with strokes of sword, mace, and axe. He loomed gigantically against a background of blood and slaughter, like some grim pagan hero of mythology. "'Well done, Hadrathus,' quoth he gustily. "'By Crom, I am glad to see your signal. My knights were almost mad with impatience and eating their hearts out to be at sword-strokes. I could not have held them much longer. What of the wizard?' "'He has gone down the dim road to Acheron, answered Hadrathus, "'and I, I am for Tarantia. "'My work is done here, and I have a task to perform at the temple of Mithra. "'All our work is done here. "'On this field we have saved Aquilonia, and more than Aquilonia. "'Your ride to your capital will be a triumphal procession through a kingdom mad with joy. "'All Aquilonia will be cheering the return of their king.' And so, until we meet again in the great royal hall, farewell. Conan stood silently, watching the priest as he went. From various parts of the field, knights were hurrying toward him. He saw Palantides, Strasero, Prospero, Servius Galanus, their armor splashed with crimson. The thunder of battle was giving way to a roar of triumph and acclaim. All eyes, hot with strife and shining with exultation, were turned toward the great black figure of the king, mailed arms, brandished red-stained swords. A confused torrent of sound rose, deep and thunderous as the sea surf. Hail, Conan, king of Aquilonia! 
Tarascus spoke. You have not yet named my ransom. Conan laughed and slapped his sword home in its scabbard. He flecked his mighty arms and ran his blood-stained fingers through his thick black locks, as if feeling there his re-won crown. There is a girl in your seraglio named Zenobia? Why, yes, so there is. Very well. The king smiled, as at an exceedingly pleasant memory. She shall be your ransom, and naught else. I will come to Belverus for her, as I promised. She was a slave in Demedia, but I will make her queen of Aquilonia. End of chapter 22 End of The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard This book recorded by Phil Chenevere in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, December 2017